black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, Going to be bringing two witnesses on. Uh, one was a roadside crossing in Canada, and the other one actually had to do with, it's kind of a protect, uh, transportation show tonight. The other one, uh, a gentleman broke down, uh, Mike, he had a, a flat tire and ended up driving it all the way to his girlfriend's home uh, when he saw the creature. Uh, but before we get into that, I figured we'd do a little bit of uh, Bigfoot news. I got Woody here in studio with me. Woody, how are you tonight? Doing good, brother. Doing good, brother. Uh, thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure to stop by uh, Sasquatch Chronicles and get to say hi to you and, and the fans out there. So thanks again. Yeah, and Woody's got the podcast, uh, the Renegade podcast. Uh, very cool show. I get to jump on there. Woody puts up with me coming on his show, and we just talk about whatever. So if you get a chance, check it out. It's on iTunes, Stitcher. And I know we got to record, and <laughs> we'll have to do another one. I know we've been putting it off. Uh, but what do, you have, what do you have for us regarding news? Well, some of the news and news that I have is I think people are going to find really interesting. So there's a city that's called Ever, Evergreen City, which is a city in Alabama. And what they've done is they, they're calling it the Bigfoot Capital. And they actually uh, voted on this and decided to change the name of it. Uh, and here's a clip. And covering Conecuh County, the city of Evergreen is adding a new title to its resume. It's already known as the colored green capital. Now it's Alabama's Bigfoot capital, too. Yes, you heard me right. Bigfoot. You see, there's been numerous Sasquatch sightings in Evergreen lately. So many that officials invited researchers to investigate. After finding evidence of what some say is Bigfoot, the city council decided to make the most of it. And they voted unanimously to give Evergreen the new distinction sounds like a uh, marketing play if i ever heard one yeah it's kind of funny they actually voted on it and uh, they have this new distinction and new name so uh, apparently there's been a lot of uh, bigfoot sightings in uh, in the evergreen uh, city of evergreen so cool story interesting uh marketing play yeah possibly (laughs) it's marketing i think that they're trying to get tourists to come or something i mean that's my impression when i hear that it's more of a uh, hey come check out we're the bigfoot capital now you come check it out yeah, and they and, and they even said in the on the news interview that they've had several researchers come and check things out. So you know, I don't know. Maybe they probably have. You know, there's there's Bigfoot sightings everywhere, but uh, I think they have a, a different agenda in hand. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah, and for people who missed Friday night's show, uh, I had Pam on, and Pam had a dogman encounter. I want to say it was like episode 33. Uh, I'm sure there's uh, listeners out there that will correct me on that if I'm wrong. but uh, And she actually ha- saw these orbs. And you saw the video, Woody. And for the people that are listening, uh, it was it, I know it's a Bigfoot show, but I had to have her back because the video that she shot that night was so interesting. And how she described it. Here's a clip from Friday Night Show. And that's when I saw what I wish I'd never seen. Man, I, it... Again, like the dog man thing, I really didn't want to see that. I really never wanted to see a UFO or an orb. <laughs> but that's what I saw. I saw three reddish-orange lights that were 
probably three quarters of the way across the lake, and they were they were they were extremely distinct lights. They were orbs. I don't know how else to say it, but they they were one was really large, one slightly below it was medium size, and then there was a tiny little one that was just above the lake. Interesting video. Very interesting video. Interesting interview, too. I don't know what she captured, but she captured something flying around in that sky. What did you think of that video? Honestly, I think it was definitely one of the better videos that I've seen as far as orbs go. Uh, One of the things that impressed me about the video was the movement, the way they moved. And and you and I talked a little bit about it um, the other night, but uh, how they actually fly wide kind of like a quarter maybe i don't know how to do silver dollar they fly wide and then they turn skinny i would call it skinny and then they move left to right so fascinating video fascinating video yeah and that's one of the things she said she said that it would stand upright and that's what she's trying to say say through the interview on friday is it would stand upright and if you watch the video that's kind of what it does but i don't i'm almost kind of curious if anyone else out there saw that you know she's not far from she probably won't be upset me saying this, but she's not far from Lapine, mm-hmm. and you know where Lapine is. Lapine is, yeah. yeah, and that's where she captured it. the The lake that she's talking about. It was right there at the. Yeah. Is it at the where you can check in and? Yeah, yeah. I've swam at that lake. Me too. Yeah, me too. And so it, I thought it was interesting. I realize it's a Bigfoot show, but uh, if for people out there, uh, if they want to check it out, go to uh, SasquatchChronicles dot com, and uh, it was posted. I don't know a couple days ago. Yeah, and you can watch both videos that she she took, that Pam took. I mean, interesting stuff, and I'm just happy she was willing to come on the air and share it. Yeah, I agree. That was that was a great story. And, and again, thank thank you, Pam. I got a lot out of that, and I appreciated it. Another one from the blog is witness encounters creature while on a snowmobile, and I found this a ver- to be a very interesting encounter. You know, since 2012, I have heard probably thousands of different encounters. Uh, from different people and spoke to a lot of different people. And the one thing I liked about this encounter was uh, he was very detailed in telling the story. Uh, he described, uh, you know, the hair, the fur, the way the, uh, maybe fur is not the right word, but the hair and the way the light reflected off the hair and how it made him feel. And I felt like it was a very, I guess, genuine encounter. Yeah. Was that Dax, Dax Rushlow? Yes, that that, the, that'd yeah. be Dax Rushlow. And <laughs> I'm the one that put the blog up. I should know. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. I guess I should have said that, but I didn't, but uh, I mean, it was, it was awesome. And I, I felt like that there was no like smoke and mirrors. It wasn't like he was trying to tell a story to, you know, uh, a fake story. It came genuine from the heart. And those are the type of encounters that you can really sit back and think about how it, how it affected his life. And, yeah. and I, I really appreciate it. It was a great encounter. You know what? Here's a story. Let's go ahead and listen to the story. Uh, I'm Dax Rushlow. I'm originally from Newport, Vermont. I uh, grew up there most of my li- young life, I should say. So I have, uh, I have had two sightings. But the second one that I had, you know, now I kind of understand what the first one was. Because I was a lot younger. But my, my significant sighting was 1987, and I was 15. Um, I was out, it was January, I was uh, out on a snowmobile at a girlfriend's house. So I remember leaving a little late, it was dark, I uh, got on my snowmobile, I remember it was snowing. I decided not to take the snowmobile trail because the uh, it had been snowing so much that the snow banks had built up and it was just going to be a pain to get up in there. I was like, screw it, I'm just going back down the dirt road covered with snow so I started down the uh, dirt road there was a row of trees coming up all of a sudden my headlight picks up uh, like a large object off to the left just before the set of trees and I didn't know what it was I just knew usually it wasn't there there's nothing there it's just a field farm field you know Um, as I got a little closer I started to notice it looked like a person but like really kind of weird looking person you know looked like somebody on stilts with weird long arms but big and uh as i came closer i stopped 
probably 15 feet away. I would estimate 15 feet away. It was at a diagonal because it was standing in the snowbank on the side of the road. Now, when I stopped, it was kind of looking straight across the road, facing its body, but its head was looking at me, but then it shifted just its body to like face my direction. And I'm sitting there on the snowmobile now, down on the road, and it's up on a snowbank, and I'm looking at it, and I can see it, and I can see little bits of hair blowing. Uh, it it either had dark black hair with gray hair in it, or it was wet, and you could see it, or it was just shiny, and I would get pieces of it as it would like kind of just shift a little bit and do stuff like that. You would see like flashes of like lighter hair. I remember looking kind of more at the uh, the face. It had a look on its face like uh, it it was almost like confused or like agitated at something. Like it, it didn't look like it was coming at me. It just looked shocked. I remember the mouth was the most prominent part. It had very thick, squared, you know, kind of mouth area, but it had this white frothy stuff like built up in the corners of its mouth. Oh, it was, I would say as big as a regular cow, but a person. Whatever it was that was standing there looked like a giant, ugly Neanderthal type human being. And I remember the feeling, um, just feeling like uh, like I got loaded up with cement or something. I couldn't, I couldn't move. Everything slowed down. I'm staring at this thing, and it's blinking. I could see the chest move in and out. Uh, looked like it had probably come a little ways across this field, which was, you know, we had two, three feet of snow, and stopped and just looked at me. And the one thing I think to this day is the only reason I got to see it was I think it it probably thought I was going to take the snowmobile trip which I didn't I cheated you know I so I screw that I went straight down the road I think it was going to cross that road and I cut it off I don't remember ever hitting that gas on that snowmobile or thinking oh god I gotta go I was just going and that was it you know and there was no thought process to the minute I saw it and we sat there for like 10 seconds or whatever and then then when I hit the I don't remember anything of that I just remember oh my god don't come down off the snowbank I never even took any of the snowmobile trails home I crossed set of railroad tracks went down the main road pulled into my driveway and I usually used to park over in our we had a, a big barn like a not with no animals in it you know it's like a big storage barn I used to uh, open the door and pull it in there. I didn't even, I pulled up to the front porch of the house and shut the sled off, went in, and there was nobody there. And I remember going through and sitting and looking out the window and being happy nobody was there because I didn't want to have to talk to anybody. I don't know what it was. I mean, it's, to me, that that was a Sasquatch, you know? And that was my close encounter kind of site. That was a great encounter. And to hear the rest of it, go to SasquatchChronicles.com to hear the second encounter. Dax did a pretty good job. I'd never heard his encounter before. That was very interesting. Amazing. Amazing yeah. encounter. Great encounter, especially being on a snowmobile. Yeah. At least he could get away. Yeah. I really like the details. Yeah, he did a great job. Well, next in the news, uh, what are you familiar with Henry May? Yeah. Henry May's a nice guy. Yeah, he is, he is a really good guy. Apparently, though, I feel like this is a setup. <laughs> no, no setup. No setup. Uh, apparently, though, there's there's uh, a little bit of a debacle or a, uh, uh, I guess, a discrepancy or – what do you say, Wes? Do you say uh, big foots or big feet or big foot as far as a plural? The, pl- the plural <laughs> definition as far as – is it Sasquatches or Sasquatch? What do you think it is? My answer to that would be who cares? Yeah, who cares? I say Sasquatch. I don't say Bigfoot, but I mean, well, there's people on the show that say Bigfoot. I, I don't know. Seems kind of irrelevant. Well, it's not irrelevant. 
<laughs> there, 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 is a, there is a definite uh, controversy that's happening uh, in the Bigfoot world. You know what? Uh, you're familiar with Henry May. Let's go ahead and let him clear this up for us. Okay, I feel like I have to address this issue. Um, there's a little bit of controversy going on on my page right now. Referring to uh, a post that I put up about the plurality of Bigfoot. I said it's Bigfoots. I've decided that that's my personal preference, but some apparently feel that it's, it's really not personal preference. It's butchering the English language, or it's um, essentially, I guess you could call it, um, you know, the, the, they're English scholars, and they say, well, we should, uh, you know, and I'm not, I'm not directing this particularly at any one person. I mean, but it seems like some people, they just don't want to accept that as a plurality form. You know, but there's nothing wrong with that plural form. You can choose whatever plural form you wish. You know, I choose Bigfoots. I'm sorry, but I do. You know, and if people have a problem with it, well, that, you know, that sounds like a you problem to me, really. Um, but I'm just, I, I, I don't want to turn this, I don't want this to turn into an argument, folks. You know, I put up a post, I put up my opinion, it's my opinion, strictly, and I wish it wouldn't turn into this big debate and this big, um, <laughs> there you go, Steve Shakey Jr. Pick, exactly. I don't speak English, I speak American. Yep, and listen, some people say big feet, okay? I, I know a few people who still use big feet. Does that make them any in more incorrect or, or correct or right or wrong? No. It's their personal preference. And then we're not in an English class, and we're not all English scholars. I'll just say that. We're not all in an English class, and we're not English scholars. I don't speak English, I speak American. <laughs> You know I got a Bigfoot show to do, right? I don't got time for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he's a good sport. He's a good guy, Henry. If you're out there and you're listening, uh, yeah, it wasn't good fun. It wasn't good fun, brother. Uh, no harm meant by it. Uh, but I guess the, the real big question is, did it clear it up for you as far as uh, what the what the plural the correct? Uh, he doesn't speak English. He speaks American. American. <laughs> speak American. Oh, Henry. No, I, I I thought it was funny. Uh, I'm glad we were muted out because I was busting up when the Looney Tunes music came on. Oh yeah, I was I was cracking up as well. I, I'm not sure if it's a, if it's the hottest topic going in the Bigfoot world, but it, <laughs> uh, probably. Apparently, there's some controversy br uh, brewing. And uh, thank you again, Henry, for clearing that up. And if we have any more questions, I I think we'll contact you on that. But uh, thanks again. No hard <laughs> feelings. Uh, and it was all in good fun. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Woody, thanks for coming on and doing the news. I got to jump to my first guest, but thanks so much for coming on. Uh, Renegade Podcast, check it out. iTunes, Stitcher, look for the cowboy. Woody, thanks again. Yeah, man. Thanks again for having me. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out the website, sasquatchchronicles.com. I appreciate Woody doing the news. Uh, you can check out the daily blog, become a member, get additional shows. Well, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Ramey to the show. Ramey, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. And if you would, you had a very interesting encounter. Uh, if you would, kind of start from the beginning. Tell us what you were out doing, and then uh, walk us right into what happened. Okay. Um, well, we were heading up north because I we had family up there out in like leaf rapids and just pretty much as far north as you can go in thompson before you start reaching a point where there's like nothing no road anymore you have to be flowing in like churchill so um this is manitoba canada by the way <laughs> um we usually drove up there just to see the family and it was just one night where my mom went and laid down in the back and was sleeping because we had a big van that you were capable of sleeping in the back and um, my dad was driving and it was just like pitch black night with brights on. And that's about all you could see is what's in front of you. Um, it would have been in the summertime though. It wasn't in the winter cause we don't really do winter driving. It's just too dangerous up there. Um, and I, I was younger. I was probably like, I want to say maybe 
eight to 12 or something in there. But I was keeping my dad awake because he was driving and just like no reason, no anything. It was just all of a sudden, I'll call it a creature for the time being, I consider them more beings rather than creatures. But um, the creature at the time, because I wasn't sure what it was at the time, um, just kind of propelled itself out of the ditch. Like it just, however, when it did that, it was more like, with its arms, like it kind of came upright, but at the same time, it was like when it reached that point at the top, it just kind of like used its arms to push itself and have momentum. But it was, I don't know, I want to say it like across the two lane highway, went in like two strides. Like it was, it was huge. It was massive creature. And it just, it looked to me like a gorilla, but it, the, uh, like the bottom half of it looked like a bear almost. I don't know really how much more to explain that like the arms of it were i would say most of its body length like they were really long like they're just equivalent more for me to what a gorilla has as arms and hair wise like from what i remember seeing of it it just it had really long hair for its head and then its arms had longer hair and its legs had longer hair but the rest of its body had like a shorter hair like it wasn't a really mangy looking kind of animal so i was like okay and I, it took me a while because I had to like me and my dad were driving and I'm like, okay, something just went across the road and it was massive and it's just not a bear and not a gorilla because I'm in the middle of a boreal forest. I don't know why there'd be a gorilla. And he's like, nope, it's fine. It's, it's not anything. I'm like, no, no, you, you can't tell me there's nothing there. There was. And I think for him, it was just more like, couldn't explain it. Don't want to deal with it. Don't want to touch it. Don't want to try and explain it to a child. <laughs> So we just kind of left at that. But I mean, before it like completely cleared the road, it, it stopped on the side just for like a split second and just turned. And in that split second, I hate saying empath because so many people really disagree with it. And I understand that it's not an easy thing for people to understand. So I get it. But it felt to me like it was a young male and just really like panicky, frantic, like, it was just sad. Like, to me, I felt so sad for it. Like, it just had this really big wave of sadness, and I didn't know where it came from. So I was like, okay, so it just, I don't know, it just felt so sad to me. And I was like, okay, there's something with this that's just sad. And I know everybody, like, just from listening, they've always had really angry encounters with them. But this one, I don't know, for me, I just feel like maybe I wasn't doing anything to it to start with. And it wasn't concerned with me. It was concerned with whatever its problem was at the time. Like, that's what it felt like to me. Like, I wasn't a concern. <laughs> so it, it like, after that, it pretty much was just, like, gone because it's all pitch black around there. So it just was, like, gone into the darkness again. And it wasn't really long that it took it to go across the road. So this is, like, pretty much a matter of, like, seconds. But when it stopped for that, like, brief moment, it, like, I pretty much saw most of it because it was still... It was in the range of the, um, like, the brights. Like, that's where it had crossed. So, so, like, I did see it for that split second enough to know, like, it, for me, had hair on its face. And its skin was, like, a, it was almost like a gray kind of charcoal color. And it looked thicker. It didn't look like a thin kind of skin. It, but I don't remember it having, like, any kind of, I don't want to call it wrinkles, but, like, any kind of, it, like it had a smooth face. I don't remember what it, what you could see of his face was smoother. And I remember its eyes, like most of everything. It was just had these really, really pronouncedly dark eyes. And they, to me, were just bigger eyes. Like they weren't small set. That's pretty much what we had happen. It wasn't a really long encounter at all. No, but it doesn't sound like it. No, it isn't. It's a really short one. It's just, it for that brief moment stopped and just stared back and then it was just gone again. But like I said, with the empathic ability, whether you believe it or not, I know some people won't, they'll fight it. It's something I accept. But to me, that's what it felt like. I had no reason otherwise to feel those things. Like I have no reason to feel sad all of a sudden. And that's usually where you kind of get the feeling. It's kind of like the gut feeling and like with other people telling their stories of they felt really scared and fear and they needed to get out. It's kind of like that. It's like that gut feeling that tells you, yeah, and it's, I don't think it's hard for us to understand that from a humanity mm -hmm. standpoint. I mean, yeah. I, I've gone into um, 
animal shelters and I've seen dogs where I thought, well, th- that dog looks sad. That dog looks, uh, mm-hmm. and so I can understand you looking at this thing and, and, and feeling that. Let me ask mm-hmm. you, when you were looking at it, did it look mm-hmm. more human-like? Did it look more ape-like when you were looking at it? How would you, for um, someone who's never heard of Sasquatch or say Bigfoot didn't exist, the term Bigfoot or Sasquatch, yeah. how would you describe what you were looking at? I would describe it as more ape-like, but with like a human physique to it. For me, it's muscle tone and it's just, it's body structure was extremely muscular, but it had like the upright positioning of a human. It had muscular tones like a human. It was just more robust. And I mean, it's head from as much as you could see, cause it was covered in hair was pretty much like it would be shaped like a person's from what you could tell. But the facial features I found were more ape like almost. Like, they were more pronounced, more rough. But the skin was not, like, really rough. It was smooth-looking, but the features were rougher-looking. Like, they were more pronounced, robust kind of features. Yeah, and I posted a picture of what you had sent me regarding the encounter to the blog. Did you draw that picture? Mm-hmm. I did. Wow, that was a good job in that picture. I wish I had that type of uh, artistic ability to be able to draw that. That was a really, probably one of the coolest drawings I've ever seen. I didn't know if you had actually had drawn that or you had asked someone to draw that. Uh, what was the conversation? No, had... Go ahead, Rumi. Oh, no, sorry. I was just going to say I had drawn it because when I talked to my friend Eugene, I think he's one of your members, I um, I was telling him, I'm like, I've, I've seen this because I just found out one day that he liked them. And I'm like, oh, well, I've seen one before. And he was like, really? And he had all these questions. So I'm like, okay, I'll answer your questions. But I was just sitting one day and I'm like, I'm thinking, okay. I've seen it and I can explain it to you, but wouldn't it be so much easier if I just drew it and showed it to you? Like that just made more sense to me. <laughs> yeah. And you did a great job with it. I thought you did an excellent job with the artwork. Again, I <laughs> wish I had that type of uh, ability to where I could draw like you do. Uh, what was the conversation with your dad like afterwards? Have you, have you sat down with them and talked about that night you guys were out for the drive and coming across no. this thing? No, we just never, it never came back up and it was only the two of us. And he now I've asked him, but he's starting to go into dementia a little bit. So he's not as he's not, he doesn't remember stuff as well as he should. Um, yeah. And he just, I don't know. I just find that he won't talk about it. And we just didn't after that. We just left it because he kept claiming it was a bear, which it is not. I've had up close with black bears and I've had up close with like brown bears and I've seen them. They're not, and it's not a grizzly bear. I mean, I've seen all those things. You go to the zoo, you see grizzly bears. But, like, this is not that. It was a mixture between, like, a bear and a gorilla. It was both. <laughs> it just it wasn't one thing. So I've never really sat down and talked with him about it. Yeah. Um, I did, however, just as of recently, I just told my friend that I've had for, like, oh, my God. She said, like, maybe almost 30 years that she's been my friend. I'm like, I don't think I've ever mentioned it to you because it just never came up. <laughs> But, um, like, I've seen Sasquatch. She's like, oh. She's like, it's kind of funny that you say that because she works with a girl and her dad used to be a conservation officer up north. And he knows they're real. He's seen them and he believes them to be a interdimensional creature. So I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. Like, I just I didn't know anyone else around here really had seen them. So, yeah, they're actually it's very common in Canada to. For people to talk about them, it, it Canada reminds me a lot of the. I guess it depends on where in Canada. Canada's a big country, but mm. it, it reminds me a lot of the Pacific Northwest. When I talk to people from Canada, uh, it seems to be people are a little bit more open about it than you would say. Let's say here in the United States, if you go off to the East Coast, uh, mm. y- you'll be shunned talking about it. But here in the Pacific Northwest, people are a little bit more open to talk about it. And that's one thing I like about Canada is the Canadians, they are, uh, for the most part, more open to talk about it. I wanted to ask you, when you saw this creature, um, what kind of a size are we talking about? I realize you're eight, nine years old at the time, but let's say compared to your dad, uh, what kind of a size difference are we talking about? Um. If I had to put it in a range, just from what I remember, it's standing upright because when it crossed the road, it was like just for coming out of like a hunched over position because it used its arms to propel itself across. So it wasn't fully upright running across. It was kind of like bent over almost. But when it stood upright, I would want to say maybe 
in the range of like seven or eight feet tall, if I had to guess. It would probably be about that. Not like not like a 12 or like 10 foot kind of thing. But like I said, I felt just from it that it would have been a younger creature. Like if I would have had to give it an age as a human, I probably would have said like late teens to early adult age, like maybe like a 18, 19 kind of age grouping if I had to, just from what I was getting a feeling from it. So imagine it wouldn't be a full grown, full sized. Maybe it could get bigger. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting, too. I love witness perceptions on things. You know, sometimes when people run into these things, they think they're going to be killed. Uh, Some people do have aggressive encounters, but I've had other people on that it wasn't really an aggressive encounter. They see the creature, and it seems like it's a a relatively uh, peaceful encounter. So, I mean, and those do happen. Uh, I I wanted to ask you, what do you think that these creatures are? Um, Actually, it's funny because I spent most of last night making my own theories to discover that they're already existent theories. Cause I used to be an anthropology student once upon a time. And <laughs> I had a book of all the hominids and all the evolutionary like levels of what they've been able to claim. And for a while I actually thought they were like a descendant, like a, I guess it depends what way you want to go with it. Everybody's kind of got like a descendant of like robustus at one point is kind of what I thought. And then I kind of looked at the robustus and based on what I remember seeing and the face structure robustus, I just found like the cheekbones on it, the zygomatic arches on it were just like way too pronounced. Like it was just too big. Mind you, the one that I saw had a lot of hair on it. So I was just kind of trying to like make my own theories as to what it could have been. Like I, I, I know it was a Sasquatch that I do know, but for me, I think a Sasquatch or Bigfoot, whatever you want to go about calling it, would be more of like human descendant line that just they thought went extinct, but just disappeared and crossed a land bridge when we had them. And then it just ended up here. So I had the one theory going, but then there was also the uh, Gynopithecus theory. So I was like, okay, I kind of looked at that one a little bit too, but uh, that's more along the lines of what I'm thinking they are, just based on the fact that they're so to look at them they're they're human like like they have the structure of a human body wise but they're just so much larger and robust and yeah i just figured that that was kind of the thing because some of those apes that branched off there were some that were bigger that just went extinct and then there were some that were smaller but that was millions of years ago so i mean they would have evolved to grow into bigger beings and there's nothing to say that it wouldn't be a much taller creature later on in its evolutionary period. So I was just kind of looking at those things, but I think that's probably more along the lines of what they are. Yeah. And it's an interesting take. And that's why I always enjoy asking eyewitnesses what they think it is, because, (laughs) uh, you know, at the end of the day, no one has one in their garage or studying. So there's really no wrong answer uh, on what these things are. It's interesting though. I'm always interested in roadside crossings because it would make more sense for a wild animal Especially because when we think of Sasquatch, we think of them being on a higher intellect level than, let's Mm -hmm. say, a deer or, let's say, a bear. Uh, Mm -hmm. Even a bear is smarter than a deer. But uh, for them to cross in front of a car, you hear about all these things that Sasquatch does. You know, how they're able to outsmart uh, trail cams. They're able Mm -hmm. to, you know, outwit most humans. But then you hear an encounter like yours, and and I've heard a million of them, but... Well, I say a million loosely, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you hear an encounter like that, and it's like, well, why wouldn't it just wait for the car to pass and then cross the road? Why wait to the last minute, pull yourself out of a ditch, take two steps, and then wait on the edge of the road as the car goes by uh, for such an intelligent animal or person or whatever people want to label them? For mm-hmm. an intelligent being, let's say, for the sake, sake of argument. For an yeah. intelligent being, why not wait until the car passes by? You know they've seen cars before. Yeah, uh, probably well, wasn't. Yeah, I mean, wh- and mm-hmm. what's your take on that? Just your own personal opinion. Well, the thing with up here that I did think personally was that there's not a lot of people that pass through there. Like when you drive on the road, you barely run across people. You just don't. So, I mean, there's not a great population up there. Like the majority of the population is located further down south towards the border between Canada and the U S and where I'm talking is like way up North. And it's literally just like pine trees. There's nothing but pine trees. 
That's all you can see driving on the road. So, I mean, I'm just assuming, just from thinking about it logically, that they probably don't see a lot of people. And they don't have the contact with the people. So, I mean, a car going by, whatever. I mean, they probably just don't really even think twice about it. They just go. Because, I mean, if you're not used to them going by all the time and they're not always there... I don't even know, like, really how often they would see, because, like I said, the cars barely ever pass because nobody really drives the road. I mean, I guess whoever's going between up north and further down, but it's not a well-driven road, I would say. It's a highway, but, you know, unless you have a reason to be going up there, you're not going to be. Like, it's not, like, the ton of trees that we have and the kind of forest that we have, it's not one where, like, you go hunting, (laughs) Because if you start hunting in there and you don't know your way around, you're just going to get lost really bad. And it's just like endless trees for miles and they don't stop. So you really need to know where you're going. And I mean, all the communities up there, there's not a lot of them. And if there are, they're not highly populated. And the most of those people, if they're hunting, they probably hunt just around where they are. They have an area they hunt. They don't like go all the way out. So, I mean, this creature in and of itself, it doesn't have competition up there. So I don't think they get like they don't come out a lot so i think that one in particular that i saw was just more like it was just frantic and trying to get across the road i don't think it really thought anything of anything around it (laughs) like a car coming at it because again they don't go up there that often it's not a highly driven road so that's what i think it just kind of went like it was more concerned with whatever it had going at the time rather than what was coming at it (laughs) yeah and that makes sense that makes sense it still fascinates me though You know, that they would still try and cross a road when they could wait two seconds, car goes by, and then they can cross a road. Uh, You know, you see a lot of deer do that. They'll they'll cross right in front of you. I I hate that here on the back countries or back Mm -hmm. roads here in in, um, the Pacific Northwest. One thing you got to worry about is deer because they'll dart in front of you uh, and they'll wreck your car. But when you think of Sasquatch, you just think of them on a different level intellectually to mm-hmm. where they wouldn't be so quick to dart in front of a car like that and hope for the best. But you hear them do that all the time, and it always blows me away, especially roadside crossings, that you know if they would have just waited two seconds later, cross the road, no one would have ever seen them. That's true. Yeah. Maybe they just aren't worried about what's coming at them. Maybe they have enough confidence that it's not something that they couldn't take on if they needed to or maybe they just they know the timing that it takes for them to get across that it doesn't they're not going to get hit or they're not going to like run into it at all i imagine they probably know their timing pretty well to get across the road how long it takes them i don't think i don't know for me that would be something else i would think is maybe they just don't they aren't concerned with things around them necessarily in that way yeah, it's still interesting, especially roadside crossings. I think that is the encounter most people want. You know, they don't want to run into them when they're hiking and be 15, 20 feet away from one. No. <laughs> most hunters don't want to run into them. Uh, and there's something about being in a car, being able to keep driving. <laughs> yeah. You know, put your ga- you put your foot down on the gas and keep going uh, yeah. when you actually see one of these things. And, uh, you know, I just appreciate you coming on and, and sharing the encounter. It's a very interesting encounter. I love mm-hmm. roadside crossing uh, type encounters, and you know, you giving your input on on the feelings of the creature and all that other stuff. You know, that's mm-hmm. really where most people get their information. That's where you really gather so much information. Is uh, as you, you may have heard on the show, Ramey, is uh, I always ask people what their perception of of what was going on in, in that moment, mm-hmm. uh, and it gives you a lot of insight gives you a lot of insight to ask someone what they think was going on or what was going on with the creature. And Mm -hmm. uh, I just can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing it. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for Next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Mike. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for having me, Wes. Yeah, no, I appreciate you being here and taking the time to uh, share your encounter. Uh, If you would, for the audience, maybe start from the beginning. Let's talk about what you were out doing And then, uh, if you would, just kind of walk us into your first encounter. Well, this was the spring of 2013. I had just relocated from Chicago, Illinois, uh, down to Springdale, Arkansas. And I had met a girl online who resided in uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma, right over the border there. We had uh, been seeing each other for a couple months. 
um, this particular night, we had went to go see one of her friends in a, a small town called Lost City. I, I believe it's somewhere on the northwest side of Tahlequah. And uh, i got to tell you, it's beautiful. It's nothing like Chicago. Uh, it, it's, it's completely different than what I had ever seen and experienced. Um, wonderful culture, um, a lot of Native Americans and things like that. At any rate, we, uh, we were in Lost City, and we were making our way back through Tahlequah and uh, into a small town called Keys. And uh, it's about, uh, say, a good hour drive uh, from Tahlequah into Keys, Oklahoma. It's on the, uh, on, on the one side of a mountain. Uh, it's long, long roads to get there, uh, paved roads, of course, but uh, there's no lights on any of the roads. It's just your headlights and the moonlight. This particular time, I, everything was fine. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, we had left Lost City, and uh, we had just begun making our way through Tahlequah and into Keys. We came across a turn, and something didn't seem right. The, the, the car had bounced, and um, I was unsure of what, what had happened. We were out in the country, and you know we were surrounded by trees, and I began to hear the tire, which I thought was the rear tire at the time on my Jeep Wrangler, but uh, in fact, it was the front tire, driver's side. There was a sound to it that just didn't seem right. It sounded like a flat tire. Um, I could start to smell the rubber, and I knew that we were we were right up the street from the home. So she was begging me not to stop the, the Jeep because if we ended up stopping it, there's a chance that we couldn't get it out it'd get stuck, we'd end up having to walk the rest of the way and without there being any street lights out that way and the nearest neighbor is who knows how long, I ended up biting down and just driving. I knew I was going to damage the, the rim on the car and on the Jeep there and and I was going to damage my brand new tire. Uh, this The tires were probably only a couple months old. Anyhow, ended up making it up the road, making a left-hand turn into her little uh, subdivision neighborhood or what whatnot. I wouldn't call it a subdivision. But anyhow, we ended up parking the Jeep there. I looked at it, and I, I thought it was going to be more damaged than just the wheel. It turns out it was the rim and the wheel, and, and uh, so I ended up letting her know that we were going to end up uh, switching that out tomorrow early in the morning. So that was no, no biggie because I had a spare. Uh, but I wasn't going to perform the work, so we ended up going inside inside the home. I'd say it was about maybe a half hour or so, 45 minutes. We were sitting in the back bedroom of this trailer home. The window was open. It was a nice night. Uh, we got nice, cool air. Uh, we like to open up the windows you know, to get that fresh air, that, that nice breeze to come through. Beautiful night, spring. I could see the... The moonlight was glistening off the top of the trees, uh, creating one of the most beautiful sights that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it was it was fascinating. Um, so we were sitting there talking, and she had told me that she felt a little uneasy. She had thought that she had seen something or heard something out that back window, and you know, I told her, well, there's really no nothing out here. Um, you know, maybe you heard an animal or, or something. And uh, so I thought I'd tell her I'd go and check it out. So I walked up to the window and uh, I looked out. My eyes were trying to get adjusted to what I was trying to look out outside because it was bright inside and it was dark outside. And I I was able to to see something and my my eyes are starting to focus on something that was approximately 20 feet away um so i started making out a shape at first and you know it just it just it, it wasn't right because what i was seeing was a depiction of a um a man who was very big uh very large very big man 
it was standing there looking in at me. I wasn't afraid because I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. I, I guess I was in shock, more in awe. I was taking in what I was seeing. I didn't feel like, I don't even know what I felt. I just knew that what I was seeing was a once in a lifetime experience. And it just, it, it, it just, it kind of threw me back. Uh, I was staring at it for about uh, 15 seconds. It just, it reminded me of just a, a Neanderthal or some sort of a caveman or some weird looking man or something. And I'm curious, Mike, can you just, can you describe for the audience what you were looking at beyond a Neanderthal? What was it about its appearance that threw you off to, that made you stop and go, okay, that's not a person? Well, first of all, the, the trailer home sits up about, I'd say the window, it sits up about, uh, I'd say a good 12, 15 feet, something like that. And it was eye level with the uh, middle of the window, uh, unless somebody had, you know, so happened to have a ladder or something and they were peeping in. But like I said, she doesn't really have neighbors. Um, it was just a very awkward moment. What I was staring at was a large ape-like man who had a huge head, probably stood about uh, 8 to 10 feet tall, I would say, around that. The shoulders were wide, about maybe 3 feet. I wouldn't say it was more than 3 feet. I'd say it was just pretty close to that. It had a human face. It had a... So if I describe it from the head down, down to the shoulders, which is all that I've seen, starting with the, the head, it was a massive head, uh, a very strong jaw. It had what I would consider to look like a five o'clock shadow and darker, darker hair on the face. And it was the, the hair around it was like a, like a white, or a yellow matted type of fur that had blonde hair coming off of that fur. Um, it was long. I'd say about uh, a couple inches at least, for sure. The, the skin color of this creature was like a, almost like a gray, maybe like a gray or something along those lines. It had a brow above its eye, both eyes, um, you know, like a kind of, uh, with respect, you know, uh, like a Down syndrome type of look in that sense. I know that's a poor example to describe it, but if I don't have anything to describe. The eyes were inset. They were almond-shaped and dark. The, the nose was very peculiar to me because it was like a man's nose, but it was flat on the bridge about... Uh, I'd say three inches wide at least at the bridge. And at the base of the nose, I'd say it was about four inches. It just looked like a, like a big flat nose uh, that was wide. What struck me as ape-like to this deal was the hair that it had all over its body and the lips. The lips is what I ended up focusing on in that time. I looked down from where I was trying to, to see what the hell I was looking at, and I saw its lips go. It was, uh, the lips would, the lips had moved to like a pucker, as if you would blow someone a kiss kind of look. Um, and then when it went back to its resting stage, it wasn't underneath it, underneath its nose, like a normal person would be, its lips were huge, it was were wide, and it reminded me of the simple monkey toy off of Toy Story 3, where that the monkey had wide, thin lips that went from cheek to cheek. Like I said, it had a very strong jaw. It didn't make any sound. I didn't smell any kind of an odor. I, I, its neck, it, it had a neck, but the neck was, it was like a, like a very thick shoulders, uh, maybe like a, like the trapezoids were just massive and it just blended in. 
I ended up taking a look over to the right to to which would be the left shoulder of this thing, which would have been my right. And what I saw around was approximately 11 of them, uh, at least more than 9, 10, 11. I saw a couple of them in the trees, and they too had white colored fur or like a yellow, like a yellow type of color to them. I couldn't see any features on them. I just knew that some were big, some were small. Um, some of them were sitting on the trees. Some of them were climbing down from the trees and walking to the back of the creek bed. It was like a like a big team of them. And at that point, I'd say my 15 seconds were up. I was taking everything in that I knew what I was looking at. I ended up closing the window and closing the blinds. And I told her, uh, my ex-girlfriend, my girlfriend at the time, that there was large men that were outside. She had asked me not to, to talk about that. I, I guess there, I, the people in Cherokee County are superstitious uh, to the Bigfoot phenomena. And it's mostly comprised of, I would say, Native Americans and, and you know, different people of, of cultures in relations to, to that. Um, so it was not to be talked about, but I, I didn't say that it was a Bigfoot. I just knew what I was seeing is what they call a Bigfoot. Coming from Chicago, I was never exposed to anything like that. I never, it, it's not something that we talk about. It's not in our language. It's not part of our culture. It's not something that is mainstream. What I saw that that night was something that changed my life and I I just it wasn't a terrifying experience it was just a very awkward and unsettling feeling knowing that I almost feel like I've been lied to all my life I I, I knew what I saw and it, it just doesn't make sense on what the big secret is why are why is it not being disclosed Nobody could convince me otherwise what I seen that night was not a, a tall man. Did it worry you at all? I mean, here you got this thing 20 feet away from the window, and you're seeing a bunch of other ones. Uh, I, I just, I mean, did, did, what was going through your mind at the time? I don't know that I could shut the window and just call it a night at that point. I think I would have been, you know, who knows what I would have done in that situation. I, I wasn't there, but uh, I, I, I just think I would have uh, been tripping out over it. You know, I didn't feel ecstatic. It was, it was something that I never prepared myself for. So I didn't have a first response to what I was seeing. I think I was in a state of shock. I think what was going on was I was trying to rationalize what I was seeing with what I was always told what my reality was. And that makes sense. My reality was was that, you know, if if it ain't in a zoo, it doesn't exist. Right, right, and, <laughs> right. <laughs> so that was my reality. Yeah. And I wasn't terrified. I was worried after the fact when I realized that there were so many of them. And we did it. We lived out in the country. Or at least my girlfriend did, and I was there with her. And it was just her and I there at that trailer home. And I had a flat tire. I could not leave. Throughout the night, I felt as if I just wanted to get in in the Jeep and just travel down, but it had been an easy hour from Keys, Oklahoma to Springdale, Arkansas to where I live, and I couldn't do that on, on the tire. That was bad. I, I would need to, to, to take the time to switch it out, and I didn't have the tools to do it. I felt stuck. I felt like I was trapped or like this was somehow planned. Uh, I just feel like in some weird way, the my tire blowing out uh, a mile down from the house and then experiencing these things that I never knew existed. I didn't care enough of the subject to look into it. It wasn't something that that uh, interested me. At that point, she had uh, told me that her stepfather and her mother kept a shotgun in the closet 
of the, the one bedroom up in the front. And I went to go grab it. And sure enough, it wasn't a shotgun. They call it a snake charmer. I guess it was a some sort of a small, measly little thing. And uh, I knew that wasn't going to do anything. But uh, we ended up, uh, she had me check the windows, check the doors. I had stayed up many, many, many hours that night. And somehow I fell asleep and woke up the next morning. Uh, when I went to bring it up to her to talk about it, she did not want to talk about it. It was as if she was shutting down, as if she didn't want to believe it, but she didn't even want to hear it. I could just see the anxiety start to build with, with that me understanding that this is her home. This is where she lives. Um, she doesn't have anywhere else to go. I, I wasn't going to press that. And, you know, she was a wonderful girlfriend to me at the time. And uh, that's not something that I would ever want to joke around with her about. I never shared it with her family. Um, I never shared it with anyone else. It was an experience that her and I had had. I kept quiet about it. I didn't want to be ridiculed. There's a lot of people out there with opinions and and they always come out, you know, with these questions and they expect you to have the answers, but I can only give my account and and leave it at that. No, you're right. And, you know, it is one of those things to where uh, I can imagine just trying to, you know, I've had my own encounters. Like, I understand the the time it takes to process something like that. You know, you do kind of go into that freak out mode. It's like I had a, a hunter on uh, about two weeks ago, and I think it was on Friday's show, and he was going in, uh, and he stumbled, he was hunting turkey, and he was stumbled in, and he came right up on top of one of these creatures, and he start, startled it. The creature actually jumped up, and he's actually looking up at its face, and then it takes off running. What was interesting is he got it back up on his feet and started walking in the direction of where he just saw this creature. Now, a normal person, or not a normal person, Normally, you would think you would run the opposite direction, but sometimes we get in these weird situations, and it's hard to know exactly what you would do in that situation. Do you think her family and your ex-girlfriend, do you think they, she knew more than what she was saying? In my opinion, I think that because she was born in Oklahoma, I think that at some point or another, this topic would have been brought up. Maybe it was brought up as folklore, maybe it was brought up as just some sort of tradition or myth or tale. But I do believe that I do believe that they had known they had known of the the subject, they had known of the topic, or were at least exposed to it to some sort of a degree. Uh, I got to tell you, if you've never been out to Oklahoma or um, western Western Arkansas, uh, there's a lot of things called Bigfoot like Bigfoot Trail, uh, Bigfoot Den. There's, I mean, everything is, there's a Bigfoot Inn and a Bigfoot Hotel. I started putting the pieces together, and for there to be so much hype about something that doesn't exist, um, you know, it kind of, I got to scratch my head on that because it doesn't make sense uh, now knowing that it does exist and that there's reasons that there's areas within the towns surrounding this that, 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 that they call you know, Bigfoot, this and that. There's reasons for all that, absolutely. And so what do you think the creatures did that night? Think they just passed through and left? Looking back on it, it reminded me of, and this sounds kind of silly, but it reminded me of a large ape looking into a dollhouse, which it was, it looked like it was in, like it was in awe, or it was amazed, or it was, so, there was a feeling of, not that it was going to eat us. The feeling was that it was, it was looking at something that it's either it's never seen or it really liked or something. The way that it moved its lips were just so odd. I couldn't tell you if it was a male or if it was a female. It, I would assume it was a male because it had a very strong jaw and it had like a shadow, you know, like a five o'clock shadow. But I, I don't know what the intentions were. I know that they were moving... Well, the one was in front of the window, I could barely, barely make out what was going on with the other ones, but I can see them moving towards the creek. There's a large creek that goes into a, a lake called Lake Tenkiller, 
which I don't know what the significance of the name is, but they they go to that creek. They were going to that creek. Um, when I had shut the, the window and, and the blinds and locked it, I, I was unnerved. I just felt that maybe maybe there was something wrong with me and maybe I needed to go and, and uh, get myself looked at or something because what I seen wasn't supposed to be real. It wasn't supposed to ever exist. It doesn't exist. And at least in Chicago, it didn't exist. Uh, apparently down in Oklahoma and Arkansas, they talk about the stuff like, like it's candy in a candy store. But uh, until you have an experience that changes your life, my life has changed profoundly because I know what I know. I mean, that would be as if you knew something to be absolutely positively certain that you knew it to be truth in fact, and somebody trying to uh, convince you otherwise, it's just not going to happen. It, it was absolutely there. It was real. And uh, they ended up migrating towards that creek in the back. Did you go out the next morning, look for tracks or anything, or go over to the area where you saw the creatures and just take a look around, or were you just wanting to get the your way that So the way that, that that home is set up, it's set up on a hill, so it's got like a an uneven like an uneven landscape in the back, I would say. It's very rocky and they don't they never cut the grass back there. The grass was probably I'd say up to my shoulders. I'm just not the country kind of guy to be walking around in tall grass with snakes and what have you. I, that's just not my thing. I'm not a city slicker either, but I'm not stupid. I'm not gonna be walking through that grass but um I did during the the morning, I ended up uh, rolling down the back window off the, there's a, a door. Um, you couldn't walk out that door because the the the, um, the porch was made out of old wood. It was dilapidating. But uh, anyhow, I opened up the window on there and I was looking down to see if I could see any kind of imprints or anything like that. And I just, I, I didn't see anything. I, I saw... You know, I mean, they, they burn their garbage, I suppose, in the back. I've seen that, but it was very hard to see because the grass is so high. And, you know, I, I, I know that they've got snakes out there. I've seen, I'm not, you know, one of the things that I don't like is snakes. I mean, you know, you're not going to catch me messing around in areas that I am supposed to be at. But, uh, no, I didn't see any tracks there. Yeah, it's an interesting encounter, and the image that you sent me, I'll try and put it up on the website, of, of what you actually saw with this creature. And the, the image that you sent me looks very human-like. It does remind me of a Neanderthal. I think you got it from a YouTube thing, but uh, it does. what If people picture in their head as a Neanderthal, uh, that's close to what you saw, and you do a great job at describing it. Uh, how many years later were you out hiking and you, you had the vocalization? So I... I ended up, uh, it was only a couple, I'd say a couple weeks or so after that experience in uh, 2013 that, you know, the distance that we lived from one another, the hour drive, an hour back, you know, it took a toll um, and we ended up splitting that relationship off. I continued residing in Springdale, Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas, and uh, where I ended up meeting my wife. I, I resided in Springdale for about another seven months or so. Um, and we moved back up north to Chicago, where I've got my relatives. We don't exactly live in the city of Chicago. It's not, most people think Chicago is like big city and so forth, but there's country out there, and, and there's a lot of it. I reside in the northern portion of Illinois on the Wisconsin border, southern Wisconsin, uh, and it was just recently, I would say October, of uh, 2016, my wife, myself, and our two children, we were walking down on a trail. I assumed everything was fine. In fact, you know, the Bigfoot was the last thing on my mind because, I mean, we're up here in northern Illinois, and, you know, you typically hear about things going on in Louisiana or, you know, the Pacific Northwest or my encounter down in Oklahoma. Um, but there's no mountains out in my area, so I just, I didn't think that, we, I would ever come across these suckers or this thing or whatever it was, but it, it scared the heck out of us. 
it was uh, it was fall of uh, 20, 2016, and just a couple months back, so it's fresh in my mind. We we were walking down the trails. Uh, we went up. I think they call them Caymans or whatnot. You know, you go up and down on these hills, and you go through you know a big forest, and you know there's other people hiking there. It's not it's not you know somewhere too far off. I'm not going to give the location because I currently reside here. I don't necessarily want any kind of publicity or anything like that. I don't want to draw attention per se to where I live. That's not what I would want. But I give you my encounter. We were walking down the trail, and there was a trail called the Coyote Trail. And because we had our two kids, the last thing that we wanted was to walk down a trail called Coyote Trail. Uh, with our children. I think that that's just a common sense approach. You know, trails are typically named for for reasons or another. Right. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't exactly want to come across some, some uh, wild dogs. So the trail is set up like a, like a T, like the letter T. You can either go right, you can go straight, or you can go left. We continued straight which uh, would have brought us towards the parking lot where the, the vehicle is parked at because we were just wrapping up our, our walk. Sun was coming down, I'd say about 5 o'clock or so, maybe 5.30, somewhere around there. And, uh, you know, we just, uh, we were done. We were done hiking and walking for the day. So we are making our way back. Uh, we went straight, and we were we were in this clearing. It was a large clearing uh, with tall yellow grass. You know, I'm not much for horticulture, so I don't exactly know what type of grass it was, but um, very tall grass and it, swamps. There was swamps and bogs in this um, preserve or whatnot. At any rate, uh, out of nowhere, in while we were in the middle of this clearing, we were screamed at. There was a large scream, and it wasn't just a regular scream. It was, it was a very, very terrifying scream. It was about, uh, if I could give you an estimation, I would say it was, it was definitely in the tree line for sure. We were out in the open, and it was in the tree line across Coyote Trail. So it was on the other side of Coyote Trail up against the tree line there, and it came and it was just so powerful. I'd say it was about 200 yards away, uh, at least. I didn't exactly see what it was, but to give you an idea of it, it was it was so loud and so powerful, and it lasted for so long that it was frightening. It was something that I I I couldn't even tell you what animal could do something like that. And my kids are starting to to scream and uh, my wife is looking at me looking for some sort of direction on what we were going to do. I don't know what it was, but it remind the sound reminded me of a, it reminded me of like what I would all like a crazy banshee or something like a, it sounded like a woman that you would hear in like a really good Hollywood movie screaming at the top of her lungs, bloody murder, but for like 20 seconds at, at a huge volume uh, that's unmatched. There's, I couldn't even get anywhere close to this. So we were looking at each other, and it was still going. It was still on that same one breath. It was pissed. Whatever it was was angry. It was, it was it, you could just hear it was just so angry. And... We ended up grabbing our children, and we ended up cutting through the the grass, and which uh, there was like a, I call it like a ranger station or whatever you call that stuff, but uh, there, there was no one there. You know, I, the funding had been taken out from the state. You know, Illinois is going through a hard time right now with, with funding, so uh, they don't exactly have people to, to fill certain slots and things like that, so... Um, the, the grass was grown over and, you know, the, the place was shut down, but we saw it as a structure. We saw it as safety. Um, if we needed to you know, break a window or get inside that building to feel like we were somewhat secure, I know it sounds kind of stupid, but uh, it's better than being outside, I suppose. 
but we ran up that way and we were in the parking lot in in a parking lot not the one that we parked in but in a parking lot and we ended up looking over the clearing and we had we had a a very wide view of where we were at where we heard the sound and it, we saw all of coyote trail i mean it was it was all there and out of nowhere it was kind of weird because out of nowhere this guy is like trucking it i mean this this backpacker old man was with a huge bag. He wasn't running, but he, this guy was booking it out of there. And I took my phone out and, and I recorded it. And I said, you know, maybe if something went down or something, at least we have some sort of a, you know, proof or something. But the closer that he got, I'd say uh, maybe like two miles in distance, I'd say about uh, eight minutes or so, somewhere around there. I mean, this guy was going quick, um, and I could be off. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I didn't time the guy. That wasn't on my mind. But um, my wife had, had said, this guy looks scared. I looked at and I could see his face was really white. He just was, he looked like he had seen a ghost or something. Um, he didn't make eye contact with us. He just continued looking forward and just like he just was out of it. I don't know. He just. Just, I don't know, but anyhow, he walked around us, and I told my wife, you know, I always carried a knife with me, and, uh, you know, I, in case we got to use it for something or another, you know, never know if you got to ever need to use anything, but maybe this guy was a, one of them homeless people in the woods or something or whatever, and uh, I'm not going to take any chances, but he never made a problem with us. In fact, uh, I had kept an eye on him thinking that he was going to go to the parking lot where we had parked. And we gave him about a minute or two, and we ended up going down that direction. We saw that we were the only vehicle parked in that parking lot. This hiker guy was hiking down the, I'd say it's about three or four miles of straight road before you get to the main, the main road from this park. I mean, it's, it's a long way. But, um, you know, it's not uncommon for people to hike uh, these trails and take the bike trails and, you know, uh, do all that jazz. But uh, at any rate, I kind of, I was shocked to see that we were the only people there and this guy did not exactly have a vehicle. And I told, I was telling my wife, I said, you know, it's, I just kind of find it very eerie that we're the only people here and we got our asses in that car and it, we just zipped the hell out of there and never looked back. You know, thinking about it now, I was almost thinking, well, actually, I was thinking that, and I don't know, I can't con I can't attribute this to a Sasquatch. There was no mountain lion. We don't have mountain lions here, and I don't, I've heard mountain lion screams, you know, and we don't have bears, and it's not anything like that. It was something very strange. At any rate, we uh, we were talking, and I said, what if, what if it was a Sasquatch? You know, what if, what if they're out here too, just like they're down there, and what if it was hunting us, and it somehow knew to go, go down the trail and, and see how many cars were parked in the parking lot to determine, you know, if we were the last ones or whatnot. I don't know. I just, I found it weird that this hiker didn't have a car, and he had crossed Coyote Trail, a trail that I just didn't have a good feeling about it. It just... You know, so um, maybe it didn't expect him. I wanted to ask you, when he, did he come from the direction of where he heard the scream? He had crossed, um, how do I say this? He would have passed the scream on his right-hand side. So he, the way that the park is set up is that there's multiple trails. He was coming out of an area tucked back on the other side of uh, not so much where the scream was, but to the right. So he had come down the same trail that we came down, but we ended up going straight and he made a right so that when we heard the scream, we didn't even know that there was anybody out there with us. We didn't even know this guy was even in the park. Or oh, anything. I got you. I got you. Um, but when we looked down, we, we saw this man come from that same trail that we were on 
but he cut across Coyote Trail and was hiking it down. And it was within that same area that that loud, massive, uh, horrendous, banshee-like scream came from. He would have passed it up on his right side, I would say, if I could give the type of direction where I think it came from. I don't think that it, I don't think he came from where this thing was at or whatever, but I think that he would have passed it unknowingly. I'm not sure. And it's interesting. There's a lot of animals out there that scream, uh, cougars and foxes, and uh, they'll make a lot of, even coyotes make a lot of odd noises, uh, but they don't make 20 second long roars and screams. They just don't. And I know you had one other strange encounter where uh, stuff was getting thrown at you. Do you mind telling us real, real quick on what, what happened with that encounter? Sure. This was uh, this was uh, around the same time that I had had this experience a few months ago. Myself, my sister, her son, and which is my nephew, and uh, my two boys were with us in a separate park, not too far away from where this particular incident took place. And we were staring, we were on a trail looking over the water. I remember growing up in this area knowing that there was never water here, but uh, there's been a lot of land erosion and, and uh, you know, climate change definitely is real because it's, it's changing this park. But uh, my nephew and I were standing next to a tree and from out of nowhere, I get smacked in the face twice with acorns, uh, two acorns, and um, it pissed me off. I thought that it was my wife. I thought it was maybe my sister. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, they were shocked to see me. I mean, I, I'm not the kind of person that you want to be joking around with like that. Uh, but it was not just, it, it, they didn't come out at the same time. It was like one, and then two seconds later, I got smacked with a second one in my cheek. And I ended up uh, looking over, and I couldn't see anything. And I looked up, and there was a bird, and the bird was going crazy. It was a, a black bird with like a uh, some sort of like a coloring on its wings, or, you know, and it was going crazy. And I was, wasn't sure what the hell was going on. You know, I mean, animals can tell you uh, quite a bit of information, you know, on what's going on around you. But uh, I ended up walking up closer to this, to where the tall grass was. And I saw that the grass was, uh, there was huge indentions. Uh, I'd say about a good 15, 15, 20 feet worth in circumference where something had been laying down or I would say laying down, not sitting down because of how much area it had covered. Uh, there was a foul smell of what came to be like a rot in rotted meat, uh, or stale garbage that had been sitting in the garage for weeks on end in, in the summer heat. Uh, it was horrendous. We looked over and, we, we saw a nice trail, and I ran up there saying that, uh, you know, maybe uh, there's some sort of a dead deer or something out here. And I noticed that what I came across was rocks. There was these rocks that were standing on top of each other. There was probably about five of them, and uh, it went from largest to smallest. And it just gave me the heebie-jeebies again, and I keep finding myself in situations where I go out and I come across these things. But, uh, you know, I, I can't explain what it was. There was just a big foul smell. Every time I'd go to, in the direction of the smell, it would change. And uh, not only would I catch it, but, you know, my wife and my sister and everyone else would catch the smell drifting in a different area. It, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I think that there's more out there than what we're told to believe. And for whatever that reason is, I don't know. And I don't have the answers to the many people who have questions. Uh, everything that I have experienced, I you know, gave it to you today in, in this uh, recorded interview. Yeah, no, and I appreciate you doing that. When the things were getting, when the acorns were getting thrown at you, uh, did you ever have flashbacks of that night at your ex-girlfriend's house? I, it was, I would say that that was going to be the most terrified that I had ever been, more worse than being howled or screamed at it was just it almost it felt like uh, we were going to be ambushed it's and even though i didn't see anything i was able to i don't even know i i was able to somehow snap out of that feeling because i did see so many of them 
in, in a small area. And I just felt like, I mean, it's just me, my wife and my sister, and they're not, you know, they're not tough girls by any means. And we've got, you know, a whole bunch of kids. And, uh, I mean, if they wanted to, I mean, the size of these, these, this thing was massive. I mean, it, there would have been, there would have been no hope. Uh, but yes, I, I felt like if it was, if it was going to show itself, it was going to be the worst time of my life. And I knew it in the pit of my stomach. You get that sixth sense. Yeah, it's terrifying, man, especially when you're in situations like that. Sometimes it's more of the unknown that terrifies you more than the actual known. Uh, It's terrifying enough to run into one of these creatures, but when you feel like you're kind of being messed with, you know, stuff is getting thrown at you and you can't figure out where it's being thrown from, uh, I would imagine that would mess with you a little bit. I found it very interesting that the bird was going crazy and it didn't want to fly to the other branches. It was just, it was an annoying, pesky little thing. And I think that this thing had some way of alerting that, you know, we were here or something. I'm not sure, but nature has a funny way of working itself out. And that there was just a lot of things that played, played into it. And, you know, I can't discount the, the rock, the rock formation on top of one another, uh, as a Sasquatch, or I can't say that the Sasquatch or a Sasquatch threw acorns at me. You know, I don't know what, what, who did it, but I couldn't find out where it was coming from. And the bird was going crazy and the smell of rotting flesh or some sort of a very disgusting and putrid God awful smell uh, was coming out from the forest. We were surrounded by forest on all four sides. And, uh, you know, it just, it was so, awful uh you know and, and you you say you know you, you asked me a minute ago if i felt that i had a flashback i did you know sometimes i still do i mean we're i was an avid fisherman i would always want to go out and try new fishing holes i'd you know go on google and you know see if i can try and find a, a good area to fish at but i'm not stupid anymore you know i, I know what i saw and and i mean there's going to be people out there that are going to you know laugh and they're going to you know, make these jokes and things like that. But, uh, you know, by all means, they can go continue to do what they do. And, and if that's what makes them happy, then, then I believe that they should continue doing that. But as for me and my family, we're the much more wiser after the experience. And uh, it's not something that I want to go around and play around with. I know you, you get a lot of these people that talk about how they want to find a, a Sasquatch and they go squatching or whatever they call that. Uh, it's not something that I would, I, I would definitely not suggest to go and look for these things. Uh, they will find you. You don't need to find them. Uh, it, that's the damn truth, and you know, I'm sticking to it. I mean, it's uh, you don't got to worry about finding them. If they want to find you, they, they'll find you. Uh, you just better hope that that, uh, <laughs> that that that's what you're really wanting to see once you see it, because it's going to change everything that you ever. We're told to believe it just seems to be from the inside. You know, one last question I want to ask you, Mike, is what what do you think these creatures are? What's your own personal opinion? You know, I never thought I would ever be asked that. I never did, but I'm going to tell you in my heart, and I'm not I'm not a religious man. I'm not going to say it's some sort of a demon or nothing like that. I think that it is, in my opinion, I think it's some sort of a Native American tribe, a wild man. I think that these things exist. I, I, I know that they exist. Um, I don't think that it's some sort of an ape that somehow got out of a, a zoo or something. Um, I think that it's a wild man. I think these things are modern-day cavemen that live in the mountains. And the accounts that you hear from a lot of people, they're usually in higher elevations and higher terrains. Uh, cavemen, you know, if you think back, they... They started living in caves, and uh, they were hunters and gatherers, and, uh, you know, these things are just, uh, I don't know, I've never met a caveman before, but I could, I think that that's, I would say a modern-day caveman, that's that's just very, I, I, I would say, not civilized, something, just a wild man, you know, it's it's hard to describe, but I think that it it's just a wild man, or wild men and women that, that live in these forests. I, I, I do believe that they are in some way affiliated with Native American tribes because in Cherokee County, 
which is where I, I had seen this particular um, encounter 2013. You know, I, I think that they, there's some, the, the Native Americans I think are right on. I think that they, there's more to it. And, you know, if there's anyone that, that can answer that question, I think that, you know, some solid advice could come from, from those people. You know, fish and game, they're, they're not going to, they're just going to laugh at you, uh, you know, for the most part, anyhow. Uh, you're not going to get the truth from your local policeman. Uh, in fact, you know, they end up becoming the witnesses themselves to these situations. So, to be honest, I don't know, but I, I would have to attribute them to uh, some sort of a form, some form of early human that has not evolved and is uh, is residing within the mountain ranges and and uh, forests of north northern America and Canada. If you go back prior to the term Sasquatch, uh, you can find a lot of accounts. People call them wild men. So it's definitely something to think about. But I really appreciate you coming on, Mike, and taking the time to share uh, your encounter. I really enjoyed hearing that one with the flat tire and then some of the other encounters uh, that you've had. So thank you so much for coming on. I do appreciate the time, Wes. And like I said, I, I, uh, you know, this is the audience that would be willing to hear my experience. And, you know, I don't have to, you know, put myself out there and feel ridiculed because I know that there's going to be more and more people experiencing these things. And at some point when they feel that they want to talk about it, I feel that it's going to, they're going to feel more relieved. I'm, I myself feel more relieved talking about it. I've been holding this in for the last couple of years uh, from the first encounter and several months back from the, the last two. Um, but uh, I definitely am very appreciative of uh, you and your brother Woody and, and all that you guys do. And I definitely love the show and would like to continue hearing more and more uh, of the fascinating encounters that other people have throughout the uh, United States and Northern America. No, I appreciate the kind words. Thanks again, Mike. Thank you. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone, have a great night.